Welcome everyone to our May Caltech Astronomy Public Lecture. Uh, these events obviously normally happen once a month in person, but obviously due to the pandemic, we're unable to hold them in person. So we're, we're streaming them by YouTube Live. So thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a researcher in the department who, who in addition to my science, runs these events, and I will be the MC for our event tonight. Uh, for the schedule, I'll do a few announcements, and then I will introduce our speaker for this evening, Mia de los Reyes, who is an up-and-coming graduate student who's going to talk about galaxy evolution. And then following that, her talk will be roughly 30 minutes, and then we will take questions from all of you. Um, I will introduce, we'll have a whole panel Q&A consisting of Mia, myself, and then four other members of the department. We all work on very different research areas within the, the department. So it'll be an opportunity that, that you can ask questions on the topic of her presentation or on other subject matter in astronomy or space sciences. And then, uh, yeah, we'll we'll just take questions. It'll be really fun. Uh, I've if you're if you're a fan of these events, we have our next two events that are also planned. They are, uh, if you go to the YouTube channel, I've already set up the events for them, so you can check them out. One is our June public lecture that's going to be on exoplanet detection and the radial velocity method and the precision that you need to be able to detect Earth-like planets around other stars, which will be really cool. And then the other event is Astronomy on Tap that will be in a week and a half. It's on a Monday night. Astronomy on Tap is normally an event that we host at a bar in Old Town Pasadena where you show up. It's less formal than these public lectures. You show up, you have a beer, and we talk about science. There are a couple 15-minute talks that are given, and there's pub trivia. It's super fun. So obviously, we can't continue to do that in the bar, but we did one last month. Uh, live streamed on YouTube and it was fun. We were drinking beer. Hopefully you guys were too. And, and just, yeah, talk about, talk about stuff. So our next one is, as I said, a week from this coming Monday. And the two talks that will be given are on the hidden universe, which I think Reiner's going to talk about dark matter in the universe and ways of indirectly detecting it. And then the other is on detecting exoplanets with radio telescopes, which should be super fun. So uh, I also, just as we had stragglers coming in, wanted to make a couple of mentions of cool space news that was going on and in the news this week. Uh, there were, there was the, it's always in the news. I don't think it's that interesting, but there was a, a super moon that happened last night. Maybe you went out and saw it. The skies were certainly pretty good here, so it was possible. I, d I usually don't think these are that special because you know, the media is like super moon, super moon, super moon, but it's just the moon gets about 10% larger because in its orbit around the earth, it's not a perfect circle. So it's an ellipse. So sometimes it's a little bit closer to us, about five, 10% closer to us than it is when it's, when it's farther away. And so it appears a little bit brighter and, and larger, but it's not super huge. So, um, so there was a super moon and then, oh yeah. And a black hole was detected at the closest proximity that we've detected one, it's about a thousand light years away, which is close by astronomical standards, but still not like super close and certainly not a danger to us. It's about four times the mass of the sun and it's in, it was detected because the orbits of two stars that are in the same system are, were moving around this thing and they figured out that it was present in the middle because obviously it's a black hole, so you can't see it. But what's cool is it's close enough that the stars that are orbiting around it are visible with the naked eye. You don't have to be able to, you don't have to have a telescope or even binoculars to be able to see these stars that are intrinsically orbiting around a black hole. The one problem is that they're in the Southern Hemisphere in the constellation of Telescopium. So you can't be here in Southern California and still be able to see them. But if you have a trip down to, or if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you should be able to, to see these, just look up in the sky. And if you know where to look, you should be able to see it, which is pretty awesome. Anyway, um, I guess those are all the announcements that I wanted to make. So our speaker for tonight, Mia, do you want to come on here? 
Hey. Uh, so Mia de los Reyes is a third year PhD student in astronomy at Caltech. She studies the chemical composition of small galaxies near the Milky Way. And when not confined to her home, she enjoys rock climbing and aerial silks. Given the, the current state of the world, she's gotten really into cross-stitching and has also started watching Star Trek for the first time. She really hopes that you will like this talk. So um, thank you very much, Mia. And I'll let you take it away from there. But remember to unmute. Right. Oh, there you are. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron, for that great introduction. Yeah. Again, my name is Mia. And today I'll be talking about the loneliest galaxies in the universe. So this talk is actually a practice version of my candidacy talk. So at Caltech, we have a candidacy exam that you take around now. And the goal is that you present your thesis plan to a group of professors, and then they give you feedback on it. So as, since this is kind of a practice for me, I would consider it a personal favor to me if you write any question that you can think of throughout this talk, right? If you're confused by something, if you just wanna know more about something, that would really help me a lot because the professors at Caltech will grill you and it would be great to get practice in before that happens to me. All right, so let's get started. I have one more quick announcement actually before we start on the science. So a lot of the data that I'll talk about in this uh, talk are from the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea, which is on the Big Island of Hawaii. And so Mauna Kea is a really important cultural site to a lot of Kanaka Maui, Native Hawaiians. And so I really want to acknowledge this significant cultural role and reverence and acknowledge how privileged we are to get to conduct observations from such a place. All right, so now we are moving on to the science. Uh, this talk is about galaxies and the loneliest galaxies in the universe, but we're going to start with the very basics. What is a galaxy? Here's a picture of a galaxy. And as we can see, it's made up of stars, the you know bright, shiny looking points, uh, gas and dust, that's the blurry looking bright and black dark looking features here. And then one of the things that you can't actually see in this image of a galaxy is the dark matter. And this is actually one of the most important components of a galaxy, because we often define what a galaxy is by how much dark matter it has, or you know how massive the system is to begin with. But either way, the dark matter is actually a really important component of that. Unfortunately, because we can't see the dark matter and we don't know what it is, for the most part, during this talk, I'll be talking about the stars and the gas, the stuff that we can see. So galaxies do come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. I think when we think of galaxies, we typically think of, you know, we have an image in our mind and it usually looks something like this. It might look like our own Milky Way. On the left is just what I think is a really cool video of our Milky Way in the night sky, but instead of showing the Milky Way moving, the sky moving over the Earth as a function of time, it's actually showing the Earth spinning. So I just think it's really cool. It's a nice visualization. And then on the right side is our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. And so this was actually the background of Max back when I was an undergrad. So maybe, maybe I'm dating myself and letting you know exactly how long ago that was. In either case, these are, I think, pretty typical ideas of a galaxy. And both of them are actually just one kind of galaxy, a spiral galaxy. So here we see, you know, it's a typical, this is an artist's conception of the Milky Way, looking at it from the top. If you look at it from the side, it's kind of flat, like a disk. And from the top, you can see these beautiful spiral arms, this nice spiral structure. But not all galaxies are these really pretty spiral, disky looking galaxies. Some of them are irregular because they have irregular shapes. And some of them are elliptical because they're spheroidal or elliptical in shape. So as, as you might have guessed, astronomers are not necessarily good at naming things creatively. And one of the biggest questions in astronomy, one of the biggest open questions is how do we actually get this huge variety of different shapes of different morphologies? And so we have a pretty basic picture. We know that somehow interactions must be important. So for instance, a few decades ago, people realized that if you take two merging, actually more than a few decades ago, people realized if you take two merging spiral galaxies, so that's what we'll do here, we'll simulate two spiral galaxies and that are merging together, just like our Milky Way will, is, will eventually do with the Andromeda galaxy. And every now and then we'll pause the simulation and put images from the Hubble Space Telescope over top. So you can actually see that the observations are matching this simulation pretty well. And over time, so you can see these two disky spiral galaxies are merging together. Here's another cool image. And in the next part of the simulation, you'll see that they begin to actually disrupt each other. They're disrupting that spiral structure and they're throwing out all this material here on the sides, these stars and gas in what we call tidal tails. And eventually, 
the cores of the galaxies. So we started out with these flat disky galaxies and the cores are now combining to form what will eventually become an elliptical galaxy once all the tidal tails settle down. And so what this tells us is you can actually go from one kind of morphology of a galaxy to another kind and that interactions help make that happen. But even though we have this pretty basic picture, there's still a lot of open questions in galaxy evolution about making different galaxy shapes. So for instance, we know that you can turn spiral galaxies into elliptical galaxies, like we just saw, but can you go the other way around? Like, how do you actually make a spiral galaxy in the first place? How did the very first galaxies form? We don't know. And so if you're interested in helping answer these questions, one thing that you could do during this deeply weird time of social distancing is check out this website, galaxyzoo.org. I'm actually not affiliated with this. I just think that this website is really cool. If you have kids, it's a really great activity. You go to this website, you can uh, create an account or you can just do this for fun on your free time if you want. And you help astronomers answer these questions by classifying galaxies based on their shapes. And so the reason we're doing this is because there are huge data sets, both observational and simulated data sets. And we want to do science with them, but we can't until we know what all of the different galaxies are, like what kinds of galaxies they are. And computers, it turns out, are very bad at this kind of image classification, but humans are great at it. It's actually really easy for us. So if you are bored and at home, it's a cool thing to check out, Galaxy Zoo. Okay, so far we've been talking a lot about different galaxy shapes, but galaxies also come in a huge variety of sizes. So before we were talking about the Milky Way and Andromeda, those are these galaxies here in the middle, and they're both kind of similar mass. We're gonna call them Milky Way mass galaxies. But you also get galaxies that are much bigger, um, both spiral and elliptical galaxies that are much bigger. We'll just call those massive galaxies for now. And you can also get a range of galaxies that are much smaller, and, and again, a range of morphologies. And those are called dwarf galaxies. So to put some numbers on these classifications, we'll say the Milky Way, we'll, we'll do it based on the number of stars in the galaxy. So the Milky Way has about 100 billion stars. More massive galaxies can have up to 10 times the number of stars, trillions of stars. And then dwarf galaxies, so the term dwarf galaxies is a pretty fuzzy definition. And so it actually covers a huge range of masses. It can be anywhere from millions of stars to billions of stars. And as I'm saying this now, I realize that, you know, humans are not good at big numbers, right? Millions, billions, trillions, it all kind of sounds the same. And so we're going to scale this to, you know, put this into perspective, we'll scale these numbers Instead of thinking of billions of stars, we're going to turn the Milky Way into a city with 100,000 people. And order of magnitude, that's actually about the same size. It's a pretty big city. It's the same size as Pasadena, California, which is where Caltech is located. It's about the same size, for those of you on the East Coast, it's about the same size as Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I did my undergrad and where my family is. So hello, family, if you are watching. And so pretty big city. Let's think of the Milky Way as a pretty big city. Then you can have much more massive galaxies. A massive galaxy in this case would have millions of people and be closer in size to LA, California, or you know, New York, like a big, big city. And then on the other hand, dwarf galaxies, again, they cover a huge range of masses. So instead of being a city, they could actually be as small as a single person or a couple of people, or even Caltech, which has around thousands of people. And in this talk, we're mostly gonna focus on this really small scale, on these dwarf galaxies, these really small systems. And that's because these dwarf galaxies are actually super interesting. They're really, they seem small, but they have a lot of interesting science in them, in part because there are just so many of them. So just like with cities, there, are, and like with our big analogy earlier, um, with small systems, with systems of, you know, a few people or families or very small towns, there are way more of those small systems than there are of bigger cities. And so that, that's exactly the same with dwarf galaxies. There are just so many more of them, and that makes them a lot easier to study because there are a lot more of them and there are, a lot close, there are a ton of them that are close by. They're also relatively simple. So just like if you're trying to understand how towns work, it would be really difficult to go to a big city like LA or New York and just try to figure out, like if you've never seen a city before, it'd be really hard to figure out how it works. But if you go to a small town or you know a family house somewhere, that's a lot easier to understand as a system. And it's the same with dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are not nearly as complicated as they're much bigger cousins like the Milky Way because they don't have all this complicated history and things happening in general. And so they're a lot easier for us to understand and to model. And then finally, and perhaps least scientifically, dwarf galaxies, I just think they're really cute. So this is my favorite dwarf galaxy, the Sculptor Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy. Maybe just like, look at that guy, he's so cute. I don't, how can you not love something like that? All right, so I'm going to pause here. I don't believe in talking at people for 30 minutes straight. So I'm just gonna pause here. 
What we've talked about so far is the huge range of galaxy varieties, and in particular, these dwarf galaxies are particularly interesting. So I'm going to pause there and see if we have any questions so far. Cameron? Yeah, uh, there was one question <clears throat> that's related to this. Uh, one of the members of the audience asked, what about using um, artificial intelligence to classify the galaxies? Uh, relevant to the, the galaxy zoo. Discussion. Great, yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually a thing um, using AI and machine learning techniques to study dwarf galaxies, or not just dwarf galaxies, all galaxies and classify them. But it turns out it's still actually very difficult. And the problem with a lot of these machine learning techniques is that you have to train them on a set that's already been classified. Um, you can do it without training, but then it's more difficult and often subject to a lot of weird things. It's a lot more of a black box in which you like put something in, you don't really understand how it works, and then a classification comes out. And astronomers tend to not trust those as much. So you actually have to start with the trained data set usually, because and that's also a lot easier to do. And so you have to train a data set to begin with, because the bigger your training set is, the more accurate your final classification algorithm will be. And so you still need a big data set, and that's why we need humans to do that. That's fair. All right. I hope uh, there's another question. Okay. Are dwarf galaxies generally lower metallicity? Great question. We will get to that. But yes, dwarf galaxies are in fact generally, generally lower metallicity. So when we talk about metallicity, uh, we mean the amount of heavy elements in a galaxy. And because we're astronomers, heavy elements means pretty much anything heavier than helium. So anything heavier than helium to an astronomer is a metal. Chemists don't like us very much for some reason, who knows why. <laughs> so dwarf galaxies tend to have far fewer of these heavy elements. Um, and I won't talk about this in a huge amount of detail, but basically it's because they don't have a huge, uh, as much gravitational force to keep the heavy elements in them. So they, you know, when events happen, a lot of their metals just get expelled from the galaxy. But yeah, great question. Okay, and I'll, I'll, there's one more question that I'll ask and then we should probably move on, but it's, okay. it's related. Um, what, oh, now we got a bunch more questions. Um, <laughs> we'll, we might we'll, have to save some for later, yeah. We'll, we'll do one for now and then, and then maybe you'll address them. Uh, one question is, why are dwarf galaxies less complicated? Yeah, so when we talk about galaxies like the Milky Way, the Milky Way has a ton of different components. It has the actual disk, and then it has the spiral arms. And in that disk, there's actually a thin disk. And then there's a slightly thicker disk. And then there's the bulge, which is the overall center of the galaxy. It kind of looks like a fried egg. And so there's this bulge in the middle. And then you have a halo of all these stars around it. And that's because the halo comes from the Milky Way literally eating other galaxies. And we'll, again, I'll talk about this a little more later. But because of this really complicated history, like how did all of these different components form? And it turns out that they formed in different, at different times in different ways. So for instance, the halo was made when the Milky Way ate other galaxies, but the disk was made very early on by something else. And so understanding how this happens, and all these processes are still happening, like the Milky Way is still evolving, and all of these different parts are evolving in different ways. Whereas a dwarf galaxy, a lot of these dwarf galaxies, let me go back and show some pictures, they're just kind of blobs of stars. They don't have the same really complicated structure or history that a lot of the bigger galaxies do. And so we don't have to talk about things like an accretion history, which is basically a history of how much the Milky Way ate in the past, right? With a dwarf galaxy, there is no accretion history because it's just a dwarf galaxy, or it's only had like one or two things happen to it in the past. It's just not as complicated. I hope that sort of explained the question, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. I'll let you continue on and we'll address the rest of these questions either at a later a later moment or uh, during the Q&A panel, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Okay, great. Okay, so so far we've been talking about these sort of small discrete structures, these dwarf galaxies, but now we're going to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, not, of, not just of galaxies, but of the entire universe. So to do that, we're gonna talk about a cosmological model called Lambda CDM. And there are a lot of words in this sentence that we don't usually use in our day-to-day -day life. So I will just briefly explain what some of them mean. So cosmological, for instance, means just related to the universe's structure or evolution, related to the big picture, the large scale stuff, much, much bigger than individual galaxies or even groups of galaxies. And so we have a model that describes this overall big scale structure called Lambda CDM. 
And it just describes some of the different ingredients that go into this model. So lambda here is a Greek letter and it just stands for what we call a cosmological constant. So we know that the universe is expanding and that that expansion is happening at an accelerating rate. It's getting faster and faster. And we don't really know what's actually driving that expansion. And so we have this sort of stand in, this cosmological constant that mathematically describes this expansion, even if physically we don't know what's happening yet. So another term that people will use to refer to this is dark energy. And then the CDM part stands for cold dark matter. So it's dark matter, which is matter that we know is there because it's interacting gravitationally with other stuff, but we can't see it with light. And it moves pretty slowly relative to light. And that's where the cold part comes in. All right, so Lambda CDM is just this model that has these ingredients. And if we put it together with a lot of other physics that we know pretty well, like, like gravity or like electromagnetism, how light more or less works. If we put all of those things together, we can actually make specific predictions about the overall structure of the universe. So here's an example of one of these predictions. So this is a snapshot of a simulation um, run by the illustrious collaboration. So what they've done here is they've based the simulation on lambda CDM. They've assumed this lambda CDM model and they put in as much physics as they possibly can into a supercomputer and they've run it just to see what happens. And you get something that looks like this. So this is a snapshot. And on the left side of the snapshot, it's colored in blue. And so the brighter parts mean that there's more, the, it, it, the, the coloring is the density of dark matter. So the brighter spots are where there's a lot more dark matter. And then these black spots are where there's no dark matter. And so we sort of see this filamentary structure, right? All these bright knots. And then on the right side, we also see it's the same thing, but instead of co colored by dark matter density, it's colored by gas density. So these bright spots are where there's a lot of gas and the dark spots are where there's not a lot of gas. And if you were actually to overlay these two on top of each other, like if you were to color them both the same, they would look really similar. And that makes sense because gas and dark matter are both gravitationally attracted to each other. And so matter tends to follow each other in the universe. And overall, you sort of see this like long stringy structures connecting different blobs of matter. And you might wonder, well, okay, maybe this is just like a, a weird simulation thing. Like how do we know the simulation is right? And we can actually check that using observations. So here on the right is a map of a lot of most of the galaxies in the observable universe. So that's where we are here at the center. And you can sort of picture it as, you know, you're looking up in the night sky in different directions. And the farther away you get from the center is the farther away you are from the Milky Way. And then they just put a little dot everywhere that they see a galaxy and they've colored it by the density of galaxies. And so you again, see these really long stringy structures here connecting sort of blob looking things. And we call this filamentary structure, the cosmic web because it looks like a spider web. I, I don't know, we're really not good at naming things. I don't know what to tell you. And this cosmic web describes sort of this overall, you know, these filaments that we see and most of the matter in the universe is located in this cosmic web. So this is what Lambda CDM predicts for the overall, the big scale structure of the universe. But it also makes predictions about individual galaxies too. And it predicts that galaxies get built up from smaller units over time. So instead of just collapsing from really big units, you actually have a lot of small units that build up into these bigger units. So to show sort of how that works here, are a bunch of snapshots, again, from this illustrious simulation, going forward in time this way, you can see that at the beginning, there aren't that many really bright spots where the galaxies live, the really dense areas. But over time, those dense spots get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger. And in the same way that the galaxies are getting bigger and bigger over time because they're getting built up. So to show how that works for a single galaxy, here I think is a really nice cartoon of how that works. At the beginning, in the early universe, you have all these really small galaxies. And then some of those galaxies merge into bigger systems, which again merge, and some of those galaxies merge, and so on and so on, until you build up these really big structures. And so what this tells us is, again, that galaxy interactions are really important, right? You need these galaxies to interact with each other, to merge, in order to evolve. So not only does it, so that's like that, kind of the same thing that we were talking about earlier when we showed, you know, the video of the spiral galaxies merging into elliptical galaxies, that interactions are important. But more importantly, not more important, I guess the thing that follows on from that is that environments, galaxy environments where they live are also important. So you can imagine that if a galaxy lives in a really crowded environment, it's going to interact more frequently with other galaxies. And so it will evolve faster. Does that make sense? 
So what happens if we think about the opposite extreme, areas where galaxies are pretty lonely? And those environments are called cosmic voids. So if we go back to our picture of the cosmic web, here we see, again, the filaments of the cosmic web, but in between all those filaments are these big empty regions, which we call voids, cosmic voids. And although almost all of the matter in the universe is located in these filaments, and most of the galaxies are in these filaments, there are actually some galaxies located in the cosmic voids. And those galaxies are really interesting because they tell us about these super extreme environments and how galaxies evolve in these really extreme environments. Because they're evolving in almost complete isolation, they're almost totally lonely, and so they're not interacting with each other as much. So we've talked a lot about dwarf galaxies earlier, just in general why dwarf galaxies are interesting, but now I'm going to spend a minute to talk about why dwarf galaxies in voids are especially interesting. So first of all, they might be really similar to galaxies in the early universe. If we go back to this picture of how a galaxy forms from all these merging subunits, the galaxies in the early universe are these galaxies up here. They're these really small galaxies that haven't evolved and they haven't interacted with anything very much. And that's basically the exact same thing as a dwarf galaxy in a void. It's a small galaxy that hasn't interacted much. So by studying dwarf galaxies and voids, we can actually get an understanding of what galaxies in the early universe were like, which is just really cool and interesting. Um, dwarf galaxies and voids can also tell us how environment affects galaxy evolution on really, really large scales. So we've already talked about how you know, interactions and mergers affect galaxies, but galaxy uh, environments can affect galaxies even when they don't merge. So we can see a pretty small scale example of that, a little closer to home. I get it because our Milky Way is our home. So if we look at two dwarf galaxies close to the Milky Way, we're going to look at the Sculptor Dwarf Sphoroidal Galaxy, which is actually gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. It's a satellite of the Milky Way. So it's pretty close by. And we'll also look at the Cetus Dwarf Irregular Galaxy, which is close to the Milky Way, but it's not bound to the Milky Way. It's farther away from it than Sculptor Dwarf Sphoroidal. And if we just look at these two galaxies, there's actually pretty big differences in them just caused by how far away they are from the Milky Way. So the Cetus Dwarf Regular Galaxy, the one that's farther away, it has a lot of gas and it's able to make stars. So there it is, it's happily making stars. But the Sculptor Dwarf Sphoroidal Galaxy, which is much closer, doesn't actually have gas because a lot of its gas has been rising. I don't know if galaxies have feelings. But you can see that on these very small scales, even just a change in distance from one galaxy can affect how these galaxies evolve overall. And so by looking at dwarf galaxies in voids, those are like super extreme versions of this Cetus dwarf regular galaxy. It's like a galaxy that's way evolution that are otherwise really hard to answer because a lot of different dwarf galaxies that we see close to us are interacting with something. And so the interactions are sort of messing with the galaxy and it's hard to tell like what's part of the interaction, what's not. All right, so again, to, just to recap, uh, in the first part of the talk, we talked about how low mass dwarf galaxies are really interesting. And now we're going to add to that. So it's not just dwarf galaxies, but dwarf galaxies in cosmic voids that I think are particularly interesting because they can be used to answer questions about how galaxies evolve overall. So I'm going to pause there again for questions. Cameron, are there, is there anything? Yeah. Um, let's see. Is the gas getting stripped off by gravitational interactions or radiation or both or neither when dwarf galaxies get absorbed into? Yeah, yeah. good question. So normally we talk about two main phenomena that happen. One of them is called ram pressure stripping. So that's when a galaxy that's moving at a velocity enters the more dense environment around a galaxy and around another galaxy. So when a small dwarf galaxy enters the dense environment denser environment near the Milky Way, the gas gets what we call kinematically stripped. Like the, just sort of the heat, and you can sort of think of it as when a rocket re-enters Earth's atmosphere, right, it begins to burn up. Or like when a meteor enters Earth's atmosphere, it starts burning up because of the friction, effectively, that turns it into heat. And that's not good for re-entering rockets. Um, and then the other effect that we talk about is called tidal harassment. It's not a very fun phrase, but the idea is that there are tidal effects, just like how you know the Earth, the, the Moon produces tides here on Earth by pulling on different parts of it gravitationally differently. It's the same thing with the galaxies. So the galaxies, the dwarf galaxy gets um, tidally stretched and stripped. 
And the low density stuff, the gas is the stuff that gets stripped first and that's why it loses all of its gas. I hope that explanation made sense. Can yeah, you that answer good. that question? Cool. That was good. Um, there are a few more questions. One of which is in one of the figures that you showed, why are there dark quadrants with no cosmic web? Like specifically yeah. near the 20 hour mark and the eight hour mark. Yeah, great question. So I'm gonna go back to that. Sorry, I have many animations, so this might take a while. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, so that's because the gal our own galaxy gets in the way. So it's actually just really hard to observe stuff when you're looking through the disk of our galaxy. So we're located in the Milky Way disk. So here's a disk, we're in it. And so if you try to look out through it, you mostly run into gas and dust, and it's actually really hard to see. So that's why we observe the stuff above and below the Milky Way disk. Cool. Are okay, and then I'll, I'll throw one last question at you, although there are a few more, but we can address them okay. later on during the Q&A panel. How did dwarf galaxies in voids escape from being gravitationally incorporated into the filaments? Yeah, so that's actually one of the questions that we want to answer. I didn't put it here because I think it's a lot more, it's a lot more difficult to measure from just observations. It's a lot harder to understand. Um, but what we think is happening is that, although, okay, I have to go back to the picture again, sorry. Okay, although you can see that although the voids are mostly empty, there are still like small filaments. And those filaments might not necessarily have enough matter to create galaxies, but they might still be carrying gas that we just can't see, right, without starlight. So mass and dark, uh, gas and dark matter might be in these very thin filaments that are in cosmic voids. And those might be able to feed very small dwarf galaxies. But yeah, this is all, this is hard because we actually haven't directly observed a lot of this stuff yet. Excellent. Cool. Okay, um, I will let you continue on and we will take the rest of the questions at the, at the end during the Q&A panel. Sounds good. Okay. All right, so so far we've talked a lot about this scientific background, like why are we interested in dwarf galaxies and cosmic voids? And we've sort of built this scientific picture up. So in this next part of the talk, we'll talk a little more about the concrete stuff, right? This is an interesting scientific question, but how do we actually answer it? How do we study the dwarf galaxies that are in cosmic voids? And to answer that, we have to talk about galaxy properties and how we measure them. So you can measure a lot of different galaxy properties. You can measure how massive they are, how fast they're forming stars, et cetera. But in this talk, what we're gonna focus on is the chemical composition of a galaxy. And that's because the chemical composition tells us about a galaxy's past. So to explain that how that happens, we'll go back to our picture of what a galaxy looks like and what its different parts are. And again, we're gonna ignore dark matter because even though it's important, it doesn't actually, we can't see it and it doesn't really interact as much other than gravitationally with the stars and the gas. So we'll just focus on the stars and the gas for now. So over time, throughout a galaxy's life, some of this, the gas in the galaxy will turn into stars. This is the whole process called star formation, which we are, this is again, still an open question in astronomy. But we know that gas turns into stars. And as the stars live throughout their lifetime, they're constantly making heavy elements through nuclear fusion. So that's what our sun is doing right now. It's fusing hydrogen into helium, and that's producing all of the energy that we get from the sun, that we get as sunlight and that we need to live. And so when stars die, they return all of those heavy elements back into the gas and dust in the galaxy. And the cycle happens over and over again in the galaxy. These two phases of matter are like ch ch constantly changing into each other. So you make more stars, the stars live and they die, and then they release more heavy elements. And this happens over and over again, releasing more and more heavy elements. And so the overall amount of heavy elements in a galaxy tells you a lot about this cycle, like how many times the cycle has happened. It can tell you if there was anything that happened to disrupt the cycle. Like at some point, did a lot of the heavy elements get expelled from a galaxy? Did the galaxy get fresh material that hadn't been polluted by heavy elements yet? So the chemical composition tells us a lot about how the overall evolution of a galaxy in its past. So to actually measure this chemical composition, we have to look at light. So most, until very recently, uh, most of the understanding that we've made about things in astronomy is through observing light. And so if we take light, if you, have a prism or a very or a grating of some kind, you can actually split light into its constituent colors. And so white light is not actually white. It is made up of all of these different colors. 
And it turns out that different chemical elements leave different fingerprints in light. So for instance, hydrogen can only, if you pass a light through hydrogen gas, you'll see these bright absorption and or emission lines actually at, it depends on how you put the gas and the, lamp, the light that you pass through it. But you will see that hydrogen can either absorb or emit light at certain colors. So here there's like a red line and then here there's like a blue-ish area where it can absorb or emit light. And that has to do with the electronic structure of an atom. So hydrogen has one electron that can move around, but only in certain ways. Sodium and calcium, on the other hand, have many more electrons, and those electrons move in different ways. And so you get different absorption or emission features from sodium and calcium. And so what our goal is, is to measure how much light is coming from a galaxy. So you measure the light from a galaxy and you split it into all its different colors. So here I've referred to color as wavelength. Wavelength is just a number that describes the color of light. So, right, we can't, unfortunately, astronomers are not creative enough to say, okay, this red color here is red, and this one is a, the one to the left of it is a slightly oranger red, and the one over here is a slightly more red. Like, it's hard to describe color, so many different colors without using numbers. And so we use wavelength to sort of describe the number of the, the color of light. And so here we've taken the light from a galaxy, split it into all of its different colors or wavelengths. And now what we can do is actually use this and match it with the fingerprints that we expect from different chemical elements. And we can measure how much of each element is in a galaxy. So for instance, I can tell you that this red line right here is hydrogen and it matches this red line over here. So spectra, galaxy spectra, give us a lot of information about the chemical composition. And so what we really want is galaxy spectra. So how do we actually get those? Well, it turns out there's actually a bit of a problem. So when we look at traditional spectrographs, which are the things that measure spectra, they take light from a very small part of a galaxy, like some, a slit or maybe a small fiber at the center of a galaxy, like a circular fi fiber. And then it, they split the light into many colors. So, and that's how you get a single spectrum. So that's great, except then you lose a lot of information about the galaxy, right? You only get information about the light from this part or you know, from whatever central part that you're looking at. And you lose information about all the other stuff that's happening and where it's happening in a galaxy. So what you can do to study the overall spatial structure of a galaxy is to take a, a picture of it, just like with your cell phone camera. You can, we have astronomical cameras. That's another major type of astronomical instrument. And these cameras can be used to capture images of the whole galaxy and get detailed information about the overall structure of the galaxy. But then the problem is you can only get information from a few colors. So your cell phone, for instance, captures light in red, green, and blue, three different filters, and then it stacks them on top of each other to create a color image. But unfortunately, only three colors is not enough for astronomers when we're trying to measure these chemical compositions. So we need more information. So what we really want is sort of a cross between images and spectra. And so we can do that with a technique called integral field spectroscopy, which is sort of a cross. It's, it's, uh, it get, gives us the best of both worlds, the best of both images and spectra. It's like taking an image, but at every single pixel, you get a full spectrum. So not just these three filters, but every single color in a wavelength range. So this is a relatively new technique. And one of the top integral field spectrographs or integral field units is, was commissioned and designed here at Caltech by folks, including a professor on my thesis committee who designed the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. So this is the instrument that's located on Mauna Kea, one of the instruments located on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. You might never be able to guess what it was designed to do. If you guess that it was designed to image the cosmic web, you are right. It was designed to observe faint gas in the cosmic web. So if we look back at our picture here and all the gas density on the, the side that's colored by gas density, it was designed to observe all of these really faint filaments of gas. Not just the dense parts where the galaxies live, but around that. And so I think it's really cool to be able to use this instrument, not to observe the cosmic web itself, but actually to observe the stuff in between the cosmic web. And so the eventual goal with this Keck Cosmic Web Imager is to compare dwarf galaxies inside and outside of cosmic voids. So both our lonely friends in these cosmic voids and the dwarf galaxies that live where most of the other galaxies live. 
And we can start asking ourselves questions like, is there a difference in the amount of heavy elements in these galaxies? Do these really lonely galaxies have far more or far fewer heavy elements than these guys? How are the heavy elements distributed, right? So the integral field spectroscopy gives us information not just about the overall galaxy, but about you know, where in a galaxy things are located. So we could ask ourselves, ask ourselves questions like, are there more heavy elements at the center or at the outskirts? Where are the stars and gas located in a galaxy and how are they moving relative to each other? So all of these questions can be answered and hopefully we'll be able to give us insight into a lot of those questions that we asked earlier. And so all of this is coming soon. It has not been done yet. This is my thesis plan. Hopefully I have convinced you that it is a worthwhile thesis plan. So the story so far is that, you know, low mass dwarf galaxies and cosmic boys are interesting for all these reasons that we've talked about. And that my goal is to measure their chemical composition and compare them to dwarf galaxies outside voids. And hopefully that will tell us a lot of interesting things. So this story is still going. I think that's the best part of this is that we have, we have actually taken all the data with the Keck Cosmic Web Imager of you know, void and non-void galaxies. And now we're, we're just beginning to dig into that data and understand what we can actually learn. And so if you're interested, um, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Or if you want to follow me on this journey, I have a Twitter account. You can follow me there. I sometimes post about science things. And with that, that's the end of my talk. Thanks so much for coming and spending your time with me on this Friday evening. That was great. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, let's go ahead and invite the rest of the, the members of our panel back on. Can you stop screen sharing for? Yep. Yeah, awesome. Can everybody else turn their cameras back on? Great. Great. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, those of you in the audience, I encourage you to write some questions. I, I see that many of you already have. We'll try and address those, but if you have additional questions, I'm going to, to introduce each of our, our members of the Q&A panel that'll go until the remainder of our time is up at nine o'clock in about an hour and 15 minutes. And they're each going to give roughly a minute kind of introduction to who they are and what they work on so that you can get a feel for what sort of questions i mean we can try and address any questions that you have and if we can't if we can't address them then we'll say it as much but um we'll at least be able to see what people have a focus on so you can it'll give you ideas on questions that they might be appropriate to ask so we just heard from mia so we know what we what mia is working on um i work on stuff that's somewhat similar to what mia works on I do computational modeling, like some of the computational models that she showed, of how galaxies form and evolve since the Big Bang over very, very large volumes, called, like she's referred to, cosmological, because they're dealing with large volumes of the universe and how, how those volumes and how the constituents of those volumes, like galaxies, form and change over long time scales. Um, yeah, and I'm locked in my house like everybody else, but I try and get out and hike and run and do that sort of thing as a personal note. Um, can I have, sure, Shreyas, you're smiling away. So Shreyas uh, Visapragada, uh, do you wanna give an introduction to, to you? I sure would, Cameron. Thanks for picking on me first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey everyone, I'm Shreyas. Uh, I am a third year graduate student at Caltech and I study planetary science. So these days, scientifically, I'm really interested in planets that transit their host stars. So planets around other stars that every so often pass in front of their host stars and we measure how bright their host stars are. And whenever we see them dip a little bit in brightness, we know that there are planets there. Uh, and in particular, I'm really interested in uh, studying how the atmospheres of these planets can change when they're subject to really intense radiation from their host stars. So a lot of these planets that we know of live really close to their stars. Stars are, as you might know, bright. And so because they're being bombarded constantly with all that energy, that can cause some really wacky and cool things to happen to their atmosphere. Like, you know, sometimes their atmospheres can escape entirely. So I'm really interested in that. Personal note, uh, I am also inside, like all of us should be. 
I have been learning how to cook more things, which has been fun. And I'm also watching a new, new show called Superstore, which uh, I really like. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shreyas. Um, Nidika, would you like to go next? Yeah, so thanks, Cameron. Hi, so my name is Nitika. I'm a second year graduate student in the Caltech astronomy department, and I'm a radio astronomer. And the type of work I'm interested in is how do we build telescopes that can observe all these different things that everybody talks about. And so currently right now, I'm working on commissioning a telescope at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory that eventually will look at explosions in the radio sky and look at young star systems and will one of which one of the instruments will also become part of the event horizon telescope which takes pictures of black holes and on a personal note like everyone else i too am stuck indoors but i've been getting back into running and i've been working on a crochet project awesome awesome Okay, uh, Dylan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Dylan. I'm a fourth year grad student in astronomy in Caltech. And uh, lately, mostly what I've been working on is this survey of the entire sky using the Very Large Array, which is a set of 27 radio dishes that are located in the New Mexico desert. And what the VLA is doing is it's basically just scanning uh, and observing every single bit of the sky that's visible from New Mexico uh, three times every seven years. And what I'm interested in is how the radio sky evolves over those years. Um, and so we've already discovered a bunch of really cool explosions and also a bunch of black holes that have started flaring up in distant galaxies um, due to enhanced gas that's being fed into those black holes. So feel free to ask me about that if you want. Um, on a personal note, I, uh, in quarantine, have been also cooking a lot more and also spending a lot of time just lying on the floor next to my two pet bunnies uh, named <laughs> Eloise and Ruben, who I love very much. I can't tell. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. And finally, Max, would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll start taking some questions? Sure, uh, I'm Max Goldberg. I'm a first year uh, PhD student at Caltech in astronomy. Uh, and in addition to taking classes, I'm doing research on exoplanets, particularly uh, formation and dynamics. So we've discovered 4,000 or so exoplanets and about a thousand of them are in multiple planet systems. And also the most common type of planet that we found in the galaxy are planets that we call super Earths or sub Neptunes. They're planets that are bigger than Earth, but smaller than Neptune. And we don't seem to have any of those in our solar system. And also it's really common for those planets to be close to their stars, uh, closer than Mercury is to our own sun. So that's not something we see in our, in our own solar system. And so we wanna understand how those planets formed and how they formed as systems as a whole. And we're at the point where we have, since we have about a thousand of those planets, we're able to run statistics on them because we can't really see planets form. But if we understand uh, how they look billions of years later, then maybe we can test uh, the models of formation. So I'm working on some particular models of formation where the planets form very far from their star and then migrate inwards and see if there are signatures of those formation pathways in the current distribution of planets. And on a personal note, I'm and like others hold up in Pasadena. Uh, fortunately, I just run semi simulations on the computer as I did before, um, but I've now taking the chance to catch up on all the movies that I missed last year in TV, which has been really great. Oh, excellent. So what was the most recent notable film that you watched? I watched Ford vs. Ferrari. Oh, yeah. Was I a, really liked that. It was pretty good. Yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't really deep, but it was, it was no, a pleasant. but it was fun. It was pretty fun. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. We don't have to talk about movie reviews from PhD students, but... Um, okay, so some questions. The first question, uh, so again, feel free to write your questions as you're, you're, many of you are already doing in the interactive window on the YouTube live stream and we'll try and address them. Uh, in the meantime, we're gonna try and get to some of the questions that you, uh, you have already asked. So the first one that I will ask is uh, for Mia, 
what are the most common shapes for dwarf galaxies? Are they mainly irregular or are they spirals? Yeah, great question. So most dwarf galaxies come in two, two flavors. Uh, one is dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So those are spheroidal. Those are like baby elliptical galaxies, basically. And then the other kind is dwarf irregular galaxies. So it turns out that it's actually really difficult to get a spiral galaxy at, in very small galaxies. Um, so one of the questions that we can actually answer with these void dwarf galaxies is how big of a galaxy do you need before you can get a spiral? But for the most part, dwarf galaxies either come in irregular or elliptical flavors. True, great, excellent. Um, a related question. Can a galaxy like our own Milky Way, which is a, a spiral, can it include dwarf galaxies within it? Yeah, so earlier when I was talking about the Milky Way's accretion history, this is a great question, by the way, the Milky Way is actively eating other galaxies, other dwarf galaxies. So it's right now it's eating some of these um, spheroidal galaxies that we've been talking about. And we can actually see this happening. We can see how the halo of the Milky Way, the sort of surrounding part where there are a lot of stars in the Milky Way. Um, well, there are a lot of stars everywhere in the Milky Way, but there are a lot of really old <laughs> stars in the halo and those all come from the Milky Way eating these galaxies. So yeah, and in a lot of ways, these smaller galaxies become part of the Milky Way. Um, and then once they become part of the Milky Way, we don't really, we usually just refer to them as part of the Milky Way. They're not really their own galaxy anymore. They usually, their shape usually gets completely destroyed. Great. Um, there's also, does the, and this is also for Mia, there's lots, obviously lots of questions related to Mia's uh, talk content, so we'll get through some of those. Does the new knowledge about element synthesis by Kilinovi potentially impact the galactic evolution story very much? Yeah, so let me just explain with some, I guess, some background context. This idea of a kilonova is basically, many people think it's the what happens when you get two neutron stars that merge together. So neutron stars are very, very dense stars, mostly made of neutrons. And so it's kind of wild, like most of the matter around us is made up of protons and neutrons and electrons, but these neutron stars are so dense that they're actually mostly just neutrons. And so when they merge together, there's just a ton of neutrons flying around, and it turns out that's the easiest way to make a lot of really heavy elements, elements much heavier than, say, iron. So elements like gold, most of the gold in that, you know, a ring or earrings, a lot of people think that that might have come from kilonovae. Um, kilonovae don't really impact what I'm trying to study overall, which is the overall amount of heavy elements in a galaxy. But for some people, they are trying to understand this much more detailed, like where did every single element come from? That is, that's one of my other projects for my thesis is understanding where certain elements in particular came from. Um, I don't study the very heavy elements like gold, um, but yeah, people who do study those elements care a lot about kilonovi and what they might contribute. Great. Um, another question related to the talk and to some of the stuff that you were discussing. Do spectra give us the quantity, presumably the quantity of stars? How important is it look, uh, to look at the spectra versus just the raw flux for indicating the quantity of O stars for instance, that you might see from a, from a region with these instruments? Yeah, so to maybe reword this question, which is again, a great question. Um, what can spectra tell us relative to if you just took an image of say, uh, blue light? So blue light is what's produced by the most massive stars in a galaxy usually. And so if you measure just the amount of blue light coming from a galaxy that can tell you how many of these massive stars there are. And, and then you can extrapolate to how many massive, how many stars there are overall, not just the massive ones. So spectra give you a lot of the same information. Um, you can, except instead of looking at just the flux in a particular color, you can use all the information from across the spectrum. So they have their downsides too. Um, so for instance, if you're just trying to count the amount of blue light that you get, it's a lot easier. You, you can get a lot more light quickly but with spectra, you usually have to observe for longer because you're splitting the light into a bunch of different colors at the end. And so the total amount of light that you get is gonna be much lower. Um, but you can still use spectra to do a lot of the same things, um, mostly using what people call um, spectral fitting. So you can model what a galaxy spectrum should look like based on what we know about the physics of the stars and the light that they produce. And then you can match that to what you actually observe and that will tell you about the different populations 
including, for instance, these massive O stars or less massive stars in the galaxy? I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Um, just a, kind of a fundamental question, and that is, what's the definition? Like, is there a formal definition for a for a dwarf galaxy um, versus a normal galaxy? Or even what's the definition of a galaxy? Great question. So let's start with what is the, what the definition of a galaxy is. Um, so historically, this has usually meant a system that has enough dark matter, so a system of stars and gas, et cetera, that also has enough dark matter to not lose its heavy elements. So that, you know, if something happens, if a star goes supernova, for example, and elements might get thrown out otherwise in a galaxy. Um, usually a galaxy is a system that's heavy, that has enough dark matter to keep a lot of those heavy elements in the galaxy. Um, other people have defined a galaxy as something that has multiple populations of stars. So you can have just a single cluster of stars in a galaxy that like all formed at the same time. But if you have multiple populations and enough of them, then that's usually a galaxy. So yeah, it's, it is still a, and then more recently, there have been uh, reports of galaxies that don't seem to have as much dark matter as we expect. So the definition is getting fuzzy again. Um, but for the most part, it's usually really massive systems. So systems with more than millions of stars and systems or systems with lots of dark matter. Uh, the definition for a dwarf galaxy is also super fuzzy. So different people use different conventions. Some people define it based on how much blue light you get from a galaxy. Some people define it based on the actual mass of the galaxy, how many stars it has. And, and then the actual number tends to vary. So I think usually a, a, a pretty agreed upon cutoff is around a billion stars. So much below a billion stars, that's a dwarf galaxy. And then anything above a billion stars, like that's a, a normal galaxy. I agree with that. Um, we're going to take a break from all the galaxy related questions, um, although we will come back to those. But just to give some of the other panelists a moment to respond. One question that we've had is, would you expect planetary systems within dwarf galaxies to be any different than those in larger and more developed galaxies like our own? Shreya, since you work on exoplanets, would you be willing to answer this question? Sure, so I can give you sort of an answer to this. Uh, so on the one hand, it depends a lot about what kind of stars you have, uh, because planets, as far as we know, form for the most part with stars. And so if in general, the stars in a dwarf galaxy are different, say more metal poor than the stars in our own galaxy, uh, and planet formation has something to do with stellar metallicity, then we might think that something different happens. And indeed, for giant planets, this is the case. So we know from studies of our solar system, or at least we're pretty sure, that giant planets occur more frequent, frequently around metal-rich stars. Uh, so for uh, something like a dwarf galaxy, where stars might be lower metallicity, or even if you go to a lower metallicity star uh, in our own galaxy, you might not expect to see a giant planet around that star. So things like that can change, but there's also a lot we don't know about planet formation yet. So I'd say it's very open of a, of a question. That's fair. Um, I'll leave this one open to the, to the panel and see who's interested in taking it. What do you expect the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next big telescope, it's meant to be kind of the the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it should be going into space in the next year or two. Um, what, do, what do we expect JWST to answer about galaxy formation and the primordial universe? So anybody who wants to take on, take on this? I mean, obviously, NASA wouldn't be investing the $8 billion or whatnot if it weren't going to tell us something. And it'll be telling us lots of things about lots of different areas of astrophysics in the same way that the Hubble Space Telescope has been able to tell us stuff about exoplanets and tell us stuff about distant galaxies and star of stellar evolution and such. But what in particular are areas in which James, the James Webb Space Telescope will, will be able to inform us? Any takers? I can talk a little bit about some of that. I'm not an expert okay. on James Webb, but I can 
I talked a lot about these very ga these galaxies in the very early universe. So in particular, there's this age of the universe in the early universe that we call the age of reionization or the epoch of reionization. So at some point, the galaxy was mostly neutral in that the electrons were all attached to atoms. But at some point, most of the universe got ionized. So all the electrons ended up leaving for some reason, leaving most of the atoms in the universe. Um, and we know this has happened because we have been able to detect this transition, but we don't know what exactly caused it yet. So one of the biggest open questions is like, how much did the early galaxies contribute to this reionization process? And the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to look at um, a lot of these galaxies in much more detail than Hubble, which is a sort of the predecessor um, will be able to do. And that might be able to answer a lot of our questions about that. Indeed, indeed. Any other additions from anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you, Mia. Um, here is another question. So are dwarf galaxies generally all population two stars? Dylan or Mia or anyone want to take that? You got this, Dylan. All right, so uh, just for some background, uh, astronomers, again, like Mia was saying, are terrible at naming things. And so they've divided stars into these so-called populations um, where there's population one, two, and three. And that really just uh, has to do with when in the universe's life they were formed. The population two is generally like a pretty, like an older population of stars. Um, I don't know actually what the formal definition of when population two ends and when some of the other populations begin, but it's generally like these stars have formed billions of years ago. And so uh, different dwarf galaxies or different galaxies in general have uh, different star formation histories where some dwarf galaxies, for example, formed almost all of their stars like 10 billion years ago and stopped forming stars ever since. Right? And so those galaxies would be full of like population two stars. Um, but some galaxies are actively forming stars right now. Um, in fact, um, some dwarf galaxies are forming stars so fast that they're gonna double their mass in like, you know, a, a super short time scale, at least on the time scale of galaxies of like 10 million years or hundred million years or so. Um, and so those would be uh, full of other populations of stars, right? the, the most recent population. Actually, embarrassingly, I can't remember if that one's population one or population three, but uh, the, the, the stars that are, are called, so the galaxies that are so-called star bursting right now um, will be full of like recent stars. Population three is the oldest stars. Population three, <laughs> okay. yeah. population one are the new ones. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. That was great. Thank you, Dylan. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So there was one question that I was really excited to answer here. If I can find it. There was one question, how do we know the age of light? So the cool thing about this is there's a really cool movie that kind of illustrates this, and I'm going to show it. Um, I can share my screen. So in general, just, just to give an explanation before I show a movie, because then you'll be distracted by the coolness of the movie. The way in which we primarily figure out the age of light or the, the, the distance over which it's traversed since it was emitted is based on, as Mia was talking about, the different <clears throat> spectral features in that light. So when light is emitted from a light bulb or from from uh, an LED or from a star, it has a, a fingerprint to it based on the chemical composition of the stuff that was emitting that actual light. And usually for like a star, even for our sun, there are emission features like bright regions of the spectrum, which is to say bright narrow colors um, or absorption features, which is to say a dark region in the color space. And 
these, we know by physics and quantum transitions where these are supposed to occur uh, in the rest frame. So if I just have a lamp right next to me that's not moving relative to me, and it, and it let's say it's a neon sign. A neon sign has a very distinctive color composition in the light that it's, that's emitted. But if it's moving relative to us, then it gets Doppler shifted in one way or another. And because the universe is generally expanding, the farther away something is, is from us, the more it's traveling away from us. And so it gets Doppler shifted by a, by a certain amount. That's really the way in which we determine how far light has traveled before it's reached us for the most part. And, and it also tells us intrinsically what the composition of the stuff that was emitting that light. So that's also useful too, because you can figure out, oh, that star is made of hydrogen and helium and nitrogen and carbon or whatever. But there's a cool movie that I think shows this and I will share this screen. Oh, maybe I won't, oh yeah, okay. Can you guys see this? Can somebody chime in to make sure I'm showing the right thing? You're good, Cameron. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So imagine there's light being emitted by this distant quasar, and it's traveling through the cosmic web of material. And this is its spectrum. So it has a characteristic. Uh, and when again, when we say spectrum, we really mean color. So breaking up the, the light into its various different colors and di at different wavelengths. And the, the line represents the intensity at each of those wavelengths. So this bump here is a bright bump at uh, 1200 angstroms, which is in the UV. So it doesn't really mean anything to us in, in colors, but, but at a specific color and otherwise it's just kind of flat. But as it moves forward through space and this photon, this, these rays of light are traveling forward, it's encountering this other stuff that is absorbing light at these very distinct wavelengths. And so not only from this ray of light can we tell how far away, how long it's been traveling to us, but we can figure out stuff about the intervening material between when it was emitted and when we actually get it based, ah, based on when based on what it looks like when we actually receive it. So light is really, there's a lot of information that can be conveyed when we detect it um, with, our, with our instruments. Does anybody else wanna to add to that? No, okay. Let's see, other questions. Um, what is the earliest an earth analog can form or could potentially form? I can talk a little bit about that. So we don't, Great. we can't detect. So when we look at galaxies that are really far away, like we were talking about the high redshift universe, they're really, really distant and they're really dim. And when we talk about exoplanet detection, we're not, we're looking at the nearest stars within our galaxy. So we're not detecting any planets in those galaxies anytime soon. Um, but we can still kind of think about the, the conditions for formation. And uh, what do you need for the, the Earth? Well, you need something like the sun. Uh, and then you need something, the building blocks of Earth, which are what we call metals in astronomy, heavy elements. Most of the Earth is made of oxygen and silicon and things like that. So those need to be formed in some way. They're not formed in the Big Bang. So you need stars. Uh, we think those start forming a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Um, the very early stars are nothing like our sun. They're really massive. They're really big. But soon they start to disperse a lot of heavy elements into the surrounding medium, and then stars more like our sun can form. So that could happen pretty early. Maybe the sun, wouldn't, the star wouldn't be as metal rich as the sun, but that might be OK. Uh, as Shrey mentioned, we don't, we don't have a good understanding of whether Earth-like planets, uh, whether they care about how much metals there are in the in the material that they were formed out of, as long as there's enough to just literally form the Earth. But the Earth doesn't weigh very much compared to the sun. Um, so we can imagine that these planets probably can form pretty early. Uh, and actually, we've detected some. So they've, you know, we look at stars nearby in our galaxy and we find planets around them. We can also estimate when those stars form um, because stars evolve over time. And so we can estimate the age of a star. 
And we've actually found planets around old stars. So some stars in our galaxy are 10 billion years old or so, and our, our universe is 14 billion years old. So we have we found planets around stars that are, I think, maybe around 11 billion years old. This is the oldest one. These are small planets that are not that different from Earth, and they probably formed at the same time as a star. So these were planets that were forming in the first few billion years of our universe and are still around. Um, so we have good reason to believe that planets like Earth could have formed fairly on in the universe, not what maybe some people would call early universe, but for a significant fraction of the time they formed. So it's not like, uh, and they're still forming today. So really planets like Earth can form for most of the universe's history. Um, we just won't be able to, to find them as they're forming then, but we can see later on that they must have formed them. Excellent, thank you, Max. Uh, there is a great question. What kinds of explosions shine brightly in radio waves? This seems like an appropriate question for Nidika. Sure. So there are, you know, obviously many things that go bump in the night in the sky that we can see in radio waves, but some of the really exciting stuff, as I'm sure people are excited about, are things that are what we call transient. So they're not there all the time. And then maybe we're looking out with our telescope and we see oh, there's a really big flash of radio waves in this location where we previously didn't see this bright object. So that's something that astronomers get really excited about. And the classic example of one of these objects is a supernova. So a supernova is what happens when a star reaches the end of its lifetime and it explodes. And so that's something that we often see in radio waves. There's a new phenomenon that was discovered like about 10 years ago that the astronomy community has been super excited about called fast radio bursts. And these are things that the group at Caltech is also very excited about. And these are basically just millisecond pulses of radio waves that they're hard to figure out where they come from. And also nobody knows where they are or nobody knows what they are. And so there's you know, a big race right now in radio astronomy to just find more and more of them and figure out what types of galaxies they come from and what caused them. And if anyone wants to jump in and add more to that, that'd be great too. No, that's great. Okay, I'm told we have a question from Mia's brother, which we definitely need to address here. And that is, how do we choose which dwarf galaxies to study in high density areas? All right, so first I have to do this for you, Miguel. All right, now that that's out of the way, that was specifically requested by him. That was not just, not just me. Okay, so we choose a how, what dwarf galaxies study in the same way that we choose what galaxies in general to study, which is we kind of do it randomly. There are just so many galaxies in the universe that it's actually really difficult to decide which ones will be interesting. Um, so we have, so in some, in some ways it's kind of easy. You start with the stuff that's really close to us. So the, the dwarf galaxies very near the Milky Way have been studied really well, like pretty extensively. But beyond that, um, it, it gets a bit more complicated. Like which ones do you study first? Do you just keep working your way outwards? Um, one technique that I think a lot of people use is we have these really big galaxy surveys that have just tried to get you know rough spectra from all, as many galaxies as they can find in the universe or as they can see. And so one of these famous um, surveys is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS. Um, and so they've, this is a survey that mapped all of those galaxies that I showed in my talk earlier that, you know, showed where all the galaxies are located. And from those really rough spectra of these galaxies, you can sort of figure out which ones are interesting and which ones are not, and then maybe follow up on the ones that are interesting. And by interesting, I mean sort of weird looking, like ones that don't look like other galaxies, because in science, that's where you look first when you want to try to understand how the world works. You have, you know, your, what you think are an overall set of rules that describe whatever it is you're trying to study, the universe in this case. Um, and then you try to find the places where those rules break and then un try to understand why that's happening because that tells you, it's usually where you find new science. Good question, Miguel. There is a question related to Nidika's recent response, and that is, wasn't there just a fast radio burst 
that was just detected from a source within our Milky Way. Yeah, so this was a pretty recent and exciting result. So last Wednesday, uh, a radio telescope in Canada called CHIME was, I think, the first one to report that they discovered a fast radio burst in the direction of a magnetar in our galaxy. So for context, when relatively massive stars reach the end of their life and they explode as supernova, some of these stars leave behind remnants called neutron stars. And as Mia mentioned earlier in her talk, neutron stars are stars that are very small and dense and heavy and primarily composed of neutrons. And so magnetars, as they are very creatively named, are neutron stars that have very large magnetic fields. Just jumping off of Mia's point about how astronomers are terrible at naming things. But so this magnetar is known to be in our galaxy. And so first this telescope in Canada put out a notice saying, oh, hey, I think we saw a radio burst coming from this direction. And then another one of our, actually another grad student in our group at Caltech, he has his own experiment at our very own Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And he has detections at his telescope confirming this. And then people came in saying that they had seen it at other wavelengths, like X-ray astronomers said, hey, we found it too with one of our telescopes. And so everybody is very excited about this object right now. So it's, yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, that is, that is exciting. I didn't even know about that. So I'm super excited too. So this would be the first detection of a fast radio burst within the galaxy, I believe. Right. What's the probability that it could be just a co-alignment and that it isn't actually, that the magnetar doesn't actually, it just happened that the line of sight is co-aligned with that structure. I'm not. Is okay, it a super so low dispersion measure too? I don't know enough details. To okay, sorry, this sorry. To, <laughs> I guess this is, we're getting more detailed than we, I'll ask you later. I'm very excited about this stuff. So. Okay, well, you should ask. Chris Bohenick in the radio group because he's the one who has the telescope at Ovro that's that detected it. Uh, I like this question. Are globular clusters the remains of dwarf galaxies? Mia, would you be uh, interested in taking this? Yeah, yeah, I can try. So this is in some ways still an open question. Um, Sorry, that's going to be the answer to a lot of these questions. Um, globular clusters, we do think that many globular clusters that are in the halo of the Milky Way now actually did come from dwarf galaxies. So they used to be either the core of a dwarf galaxy or they were just a, a cluster in a dwarf galaxy. And then when the galaxy got consumed, because the globular cluster was gravitationally bound to each other, it managed to stay together for the most part. And so we do think that happens sometimes. Um, but some globular clusters just form from, in, like within the Milky Way, not all globular clusters form from dwarf galaxies. Some have just formed in the Milky Way when you get a really big cloud of gas that collapses on itself and forms a lot of stars in one place. Great. Um, all right. If dark matter is considered to be most of the part of the universe, then does its influence, does it influence the gravitational force between any two celestial bodies? Max, would you be willing to address this one? Yeah, I can talk about. It. So you can think of dark matter as being kind of a sea of particles. So we, we don't really know exactly what dark matter is, but the one thing we do know is that it has a gravitational effect on things. Um, so it, it's probably something like particles that fill uh, a lot of space and, and are surrounding and within galaxies. Um, so that means that they really affect the motion of things within galaxies. But then, so if you imagine like a, a star, even just one star within the galaxy, uh, you know, our sun orbits the Milky Way. Um, it's being pulled on by all the stars in the Milky Way, but also all the dark matter in the Milky Way. And that's actually most of the gravitational force. Um, so it really pulls on everything. But then you might ask, well, does it pull on like the Earth and the Sun? So does it change the orbit of the Earth? Uh, can we detect it? Is it around us? And the answer is it probably affects the Earth, but 
we would never really know because dark matter doesn't clump up. So normal matter that you know we're made of and Earth and the Sun are made of, um, what's special about it is that it clumps. So as it cools, it contracts and, and clumps together into really dense things. But most of the space is empty. Most of the space is nothing or, or you know, basically a vacuum. Whereas dark matter is much smoother. Um, and so if you think about the dark matter within our solar system, like how much dark matter is between us and the sun, there's almost nothing because the dark matter is so spread out that most of it's like not even within, it's not even close to stars, it's just spread out. And so the actual amount within our solar system is really, really small, uh, much lower mass than any of the planets in our solar system. And so we can't detect it. So it does pull on things, um, but it manifests, its effect manifests on a much larger scale um, when you accumulate all this dark matter, but we don't see it on really small scales like with, you know, satellites or planets. That's right. Or globular clusters like Mia was just talking about a moment ago too. So. Great. Thank you, Max. Um, here's a question that I want to answer, and that is what role do black holes play in galaxy evolution? And that is a for the most part, an, an open question. We, so we understand that, that basically all galaxies have some sort of supermassive black hole in their centers. So in the Milky Way, this is called the Sagittarius A star object. And it consists of, I think it's around five or six million solar masses, uh, six million times the mass of the sun. So it's quite massive, but it's it um, it's for the most part right now quiescent, which is to say it's not erupting or well erupting is the wrong word. So any massive object, as Max was just explaining, because of gravity attracts other stuff to it, and when you have a very massive object, you get more attraction, you get more of an attractive force. So many black holes we can we can witness them. Uh, because there's an accretion disk. There's a bunch of stuff that's been funneled down towards them. And because that stuff has some sort of net rotation or some angular momentum, they can't just fall, it can't just fall directly into the, to the black hole. Um, it, it, will, it will form this disk around the black hole where it slowly loses energy and loses angular momentum and will fall into the black hole. But because all of this stuff has fallen into it at really, really high speeds. It gets super, super hot and everything's running into each other. And when stuff gets really hot, like your oven or like an, uh, the filament of an incandescent light bulb, when stuff gets hot, it starts to glow. And, and so you can oftentimes see a black hole based on the, the hot glowing accretion disk around it. An example of this from science fiction films is the movie Interstellar. If you've seen that movie, it has a beautiful, beautiful rendition of a black hole called Gig Gigantor, something like that. Would you guys remember what it's called? It's something humongous, Gigantor. Gargantua, I, don't I think. Gargantua. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I knew it was something like that. So um, that's, a, that's a good example. And in fact, that whole video sequence in the film was done with like true physics in mind. So that is nominally what we believe a black hole would look like if we were to take a super high resolution image, which we aren't able to do at this point. But anyway, we're getting off, off side tangent. The point is when black holes like the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy are actively eating up their surrounding material, gas and stars and stuff, they usually produce a lot of energy, both in light, but also they can, they can send out jets of material. And that, those outbursts of material will influence the local environment and influence the evolution of the galaxy as a whole, to the point where we do know that black holes influence galaxy evolution, but we don't fully understand it. And this is a, a very active field of research. Um, you'll see it referred to in the, in the in the literature as AGN feedback, active galactic nuclei, which is basically another word for a massive super black hole that's getting, that's getting, that's absorbing material and then causing these explosions and glowing and so on and so forth. So uh, that's a really, a really great question 
whoever wrote that because it's a it's a very tough and open question right now. Okay, sorry. I'll get back to other questions. What else have we got here? Uh, I like this one because it includes everybody on the panel and that is, hi panel. How did you guys get into your respective areas, like your research areas, presumably? We talked a little bit about this when everyone was doing their introduction, but I think it does bear some response in, you know, what drew you to your particular field of research and not some other, because there's lots of really interesting areas of research. So I'll let our, our speaker for the evening start this out. Mia, would you like to, to respond? Yeah, sure. So, um... Let's see, in high school, I took a physics class for the first time and realized that I really liked it. And, you know, I'd always kind of liked math. Uh, so I, in, in undergrad, I decided to major in physics and math. And I tried undergrad research. So if there are undergrads watching this, there are a lot of really cool, usually paid research opportunities, uh, both at institution, uh, and maybe at your institution. And if not there, then there are, you know, research experience for undergrads over the summer uh, that are paid for. And so I tried doing a lot of different areas of physics. I worked at CERN for a couple of summers in, in Geneva, Switzerland, doing particle physics. I did soft matter physics, which is kind of cool stuff. It's like has to do with, you know, how grains and bendy things work. I don't know, that was not a very good explanation. I tried computer simulations. I tried a lot of different stuff for a while. Um, but then I, the one project that I found that I really loved was studying galaxies. And so honestly, it was just complete luck. Like I might've done this with something else. Like it could have been exoplanets or it could have been radio astronomy. But for me, I just happened to have this project with galaxies and I had a really great advisor. Um, and then I just kind of kept going from there. I just decided that I wanted to keep doing that. Who wants to, who wants to go next? Dylan, would you like to respond? Sure. Uh, so similar to Mia, I also really enjoyed physics in high school and uh, pretty soon after uh, entering college, I decided I wanted to be a physics major. And one of the elective classes that I took as part of the major uh, was this like intro to astronomy class. Uh, and I just loved everything about this class. It was basically just like a survey of like generally, you know, uh, what are some basic things that we know about uh, you know, cosmology and stars and exoplanets. And I just like loved all of it. And so uh, I wanted to get a job over the summer and I asked the professor whether, you know, there are any chances to do research. And he found me uh, this opportunity uh, to do research at Carnegie Observatory, which is actually um, in Pasadena, like a mile away from Caltech. And I sort of just ran with that. Uh, I started off working on measuring star formation in nearby galaxies. Uh, and I thought I wanted to work on galaxies for a long time. And I even applied to grad school saying, you know, I'm really set on working on galaxies. Uh, but then eventually uh, my current advisor emailed me um, and he was like, I've got this really cool project for you because you know how to work with radio telescopes. Like, uh, how about working on transients, like explosions? And I was like, what's a transient? But then eventually, uh, you know, I, I grew to love transients as well. Um, so I, I tried out the project and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and here I am. Here you are. <laughs> uh, Nidika, would you like to respond? Yeah, sure, Cameron. So I actually, when I first started college, did not think I was going to be an astronomer. I actually, my undergrad degree is in mechanical engineering and I've always loved, you know, building things and figuring out how things work and similar to Dylan actually in my first year of college I took an intro to astronomy class and just completely fell in love with it I realized I really loved astronomy but then I also really loved engineering and I basically had a career crisis for the second half of college where I was like my goodness what am I going to do and I actually luckily through an undergrad research opportunity over one of my summers. So there is this program for undergrads called REUs, like research experiences for undergrads. And you can get paid to go to a university and do research there over a summer, as we have mentioned before. And I was able to go work at one of the engineering labs 
at Harvard for a summer and I met people who work on engineering design for telescopes and then astronomers who worked on telescopes and then went on to work on the astronomy from these telescopes. And I was like, absolutely, this is, this is what I wanna do in grad school. And so I came to Caltech and I wasn't sure that I was going to actually do radio when I got here, but I just happened to meet the radio group and they had some really exciting stuff going on. So I figured, yeah, this is, uh, I'll try it out and see how it goes. And it's been going great so far. So here I am. Here you are as well, yes. <laughs> uh, Shreyas? Yeah, so I'd say the way that I got into like astronomy slash planetary science was an like an entire lack of ability to decide what kind of science I liked. Uh, I mean, when I started college, like I had done like science Olympiad and stuff in high school and I really liked science and math, but if any of you have seen The Good Place, I was very much like cheaty, like trying to decide between things and <laughs> not being able to come up with anything at all. Um, and completely by chance, I stumbled into this project. You know, for a long time, I actually was gonna be a chemist. I did research in a polymer chemistry lab and. Uh, I thought that was going to be it, but I stumbled upon a research project doing astrochemistry. So thinking about how chemical reactions happen in space and how that can be different to the ones that happen here on Earth, and in particular thinking about chemistry in the interstellar medium. Uh, and that, like, really, you know, I thought that was really amazing because I didn't have to choose, you know, if, whether I wanted to, to do astronomy or chemistry, I could, I could do both. And so going down that road, I, I slowly got more into the chemistry of planet formation. And then I kind of got into planets through that. And here I am studying planets and definitely haven't uh, used as much chemistry I'd like as I'd like, but I definitely have still used some. So. Excellent. Max, would you, uh, would you also like to respond? Sure. I think I've been much less careful about picking my uh, field of study. So I, in, in college, I entered college being really interested in physics and math and also linguistics. Um, and well, math didn't work out too much and linguistics has remained more of a hobby. Um, but then I, I started, I always had an interest in astronomy, although it was kind of dormant um, through high school. But then I started going to talks uh, in college and I went to a talk on exoplanet dynamics. And I, I really didn't understand much of it, but it seemed cool. Um, so I emailed a few of the professors because I had been wanting to do a research project. And uh, well, one of them responded quickly and I said, let's meet. And we got along and I started doing that. I'm not sure I really made a choice along the way, um, but I've really liked it uh, so far. And so I just kind of stumbled into it. Um, but I, I like exoplanets a lot because it's got a lot of really young people, like a lot of the major members of the field are uh, postdocs or people who just started being faculty and, and uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of room, like people are kind of stuck on, on theories. So I've liked being in, in that field. Yeah, it's definitely a, definitely a young field. Lots of open questions remain. I mean, the first exoplanet dis detection was 92 or 95, depending on what you count. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, but we've come very, very far in 25 years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I guess I should answer as well. Uh, I primarily, I went to college and thought, I mean, grew up liking math and science and so on and so forth. Went to college, studied computer science and was convinced that computer science was what I was gonna do. And ultimately it kind of is, but it took some astronomy courses in college and really enjoyed the observational aspects of them and then ended up kind of combining them. So now my work is primarily computational modeling of galaxies. Uh, so I'm, I'm coding most of my days, just programming or analyzing computational simulation data outputs. And so it's kind of a, a combination of the, the two influences. But, and yeah, there weren't that many exoplanet people when I was in graduate school either, because it's, as you said, it's a, it's a really new field I mean, not that I'm, I finished graduate school 25 years ago, because I didn't. I only finished eight years ago, but nonetheless. Okay, next question. Um, how about one that we had online prior to, prior to the lecture? And this is, 
what's the best, especially given that we were just talking about exoplanets, what's the best place to look for life in the universe other than the Earth? Shreyas, would you be willing to discuss this one? Sure. So there's a lot of different schools of thought on this. One is you could look outside the solar system. So you could look at exoplanets and specifically uh, try to look at exoplanet atmospheres and look for what are called biosignatures. So signs that there has been life on this planet that's been producing some biosignature gas or combination of gases that we can detect remotely and infer life that way. Uh, other people think that the way to go is to look inside the solar system. And inside the solar system, we have a couple of opportunities as well. So we can uh, do things like go to Mars, for instance, and uh, send our rovers there and try to look for signs of life uh, because we know that uh, at you know points throughout its history, Mars definitely had water. So we can try to look for uh, remnants of life in Mars. Uh, and in recent years, an interesting avenue for astrobiology has been subsurface oceans. So we know that some icy moons in the outer solar system, such as uh, Europa and Enceladus, host uh, oceans of liquid, of salty liquid water right beneath their uh, surface ice shells. And it's thought that potentially these subsurface oceans could also have conditions that are amenable to life. If you were to ask me to pick amongst all three of those, even though I'm an exoplanet astronomer, I think that I'm currently in the subsurface oceans camp. I think they're really cool. Thank you, Shreyas. Uh, there's a question that was asked a couple of times. So I just want to address it super fast. I still want to know, I still want to know how that camera, uh, the IFU, the integrated field unit that, that Mia was discussing during her presentation, I still want to know how that camera is able to take a spectrum for every pixel, is there a fiber optic cable running to every every different pixel in the CCD? Mia, do you want to take this or I, I, yeah. I can address this? Yeah, I can take it. So okay. there are a couple of different designs for IFU. So one of them does actually, yes, have many fiber optic cables. So for instance, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the SDSS, they're doing a survey called MANGA. I don't know what it stands for, something mapping nearby something. It's a bad acronym. Um, but the Keck Cosmic Web Imager, which is the one that I use, uses actually a different techniques. So they have slicers. So I showed earlier that the galaxy, you take a, you, in order to take a spectrum, you take a slit of light and then you spread all the light into its different colors. Um, the Keck Cosmic Web Imager has a slicer that slices the galaxy into several different slits. And then each of those slits, the light gets split and then you get a spectrum at each of those areas. And then you, I think, this happens in different configurations and that's how you get the individual pixels. Or I think you just have the spatial, no, actually, I think you just have the spatial information from along the slit and then it gets spread apart. And then it's actually really difficult to, it, it takes a lot of computational, it, it's much more difficult to reduce this data because it's so, the, the geometry is so weird, but I hope that sort of explains it. So you basically take the galaxy, you split it up into different slits and then each of those slits you split into different colors. Excellent. Thank you, Mia. Um, question for Nitika. What do the Event Horizon Telescope scientists do between working on black hole images? So my understanding, and I am pretty new to this, so if somebody knows more than me, they should feel free to jump in. But in between black hole images right now, we just do upgrades to the telescope. So with the Event Horizon Telescope, for folks who might not know, this is an observatory with radio telescopes all over the world. And the goal of the telescope is to take really high resolution photographs of black holes. So with radio telescopes, there's this technique called interferometry, where instead of just using one radio dish, you can use multiple radio dishes spread out over several kilometers or in the case of the Event Horizon Telescope all over the globe. And Dylan mentioned an example of one of these earlier, the Very Large Array in New Mexico is a 27 element interferometer. But the Event Horizon Telescope, in order to get high enough resolution to image black holes, they spread their different stations all over the world. And so 
between each of their observations, the goal is to just push the telescope into a regime of higher sensitivity. So adding more stations all over the world just to get higher quality images. And so one of these stations will actually be located at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observ Astronomy Observatory up in Bishop. And so that's something I'll be working on as a graduate student. Excellent, excellent. There is a question. Um, one criticism of the Lambda CDM model is that it predicts more dwarf galaxies than have been observed. Is this still the case or have improved observations eliminated this discrepancy? So Mia was, Mia talked about the Lambda CDM model for, for being the most popular model for describing basically the universe and the distribution of matter within that universe. But this, is, this question is correct in that it says one of the past problems with Lambda CDM is that it predicts more dwarf galaxies than we have, than we have seen. It's called the, the missing satellites problem, but it's kind of a, a weirdly stated problem in that they aren't missing, it's that simulations predict there to be more, but, but we just weren't seeing them. But that was, that was more popular about 10, 15 years ago. And in the meantime, observers, as we've, as we've been more detailed and precise and have better instruments for detecting uh, smaller galaxies like these dwarfs or, or the galaxies in our neighborhood are called satellite galaxies because they're orbiting around the more primary members like the Milky Way or the Andromeda galaxy. We've been able to detect more and more of these things. And now, yes, we don't think that the missing satellites it's basically not a problem. The, the, the theoretical predictions for how many dwarf galaxies are in our neighborhood match up pretty well, excuse me, match up pretty well with the observations, uh, primarily being enhanced by, again, as Mia mentioned, the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, various different iterations of that have really been able to map these things really well. So, so there's no longer a problem with that in terms of Lambda CDM. Lambda CDM still may have some additional problems with the densities that that occur in the interiors of dwarf galaxies, but but in terms of their sheer numbers, it doesn't appear to be appear to be a problem. Let's see other questions. How about Dylan? Do dwarf galaxies have mostly small stars? Uh, so in short, no. Uh, essentially, when stars form, they form according to a distribution in masses called the initial mass function. And well, actually, no. Um, in short, yes, uh, because all galaxies, uh, all populations of stars uh, have mostly small stars, um, but uh, not entirely. Um, as I was saying, uh, when stars form, they, they form according to a distribution called the initial mass function, where uh, there are a lot of small stars and uh, falling off distributions, the larger the mass you get, uh, you're looking at. And as far as we know, the initial mass function is pretty much the same between all galaxies. This is an area of active research. People are trying to find um, differences in the initial mass function, especially in like extreme systems that are forming huge amounts of stars. Uh, and there have been some somewhat controversial claims that uh, in some uh, populations of stars, you have uh, a t what's called um, a top heavy initial mass function where uh, you have more massive stars than you might predict given the total number of stars that are there. But uh, definitely keep an eye out for uh, more work on this because uh, people are uh, working on this actively. Indeed, indeed. Let's see. Um, a question from Max from the web previously. Are exoplanet systems that we found similar to our solar system? Yeah, so I briefly mentioned this at, at the beginning, but um, the ones we found are really different than our solar system. So to remind you, we have normally what we think of as eight planets, not including Pluto. So we have the innermost four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. 
uh, which are all like Earth and Venus are about the same mass and Mars is somewhat smaller, Mercury is a lot smaller. Then we have two gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and then two what we call ice giant planets, uh, Uranus and Neptune, that are smaller than the gas giants. And um, what we found in exoplanet systems is a lot of really different things. So the first exoplanets that were found were mostly hot Jupiters, which are planets that are uh, as massive and as large as Jupiter, but they're really close to their star. So they orbit within a few days around the star. They're incredibly hot. We don't see anything like that in our solar system. That was a big question for a while of how they form. We still don't really know that. Uh, and those, it turns out that those are not that common. They're only around like 1% of stars. They're just easy to find. That's why we found a lot of them. Um, but we have found a lot of planets that are larger than Earth, but smaller than Neptune and are close to their star. Those appear to be really common, even though they're, they're not that easy to find, but we can still correct for how many we should find. And we, we find that they're really quite common. Um, and yet we don't have any in our solar system. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, we don't really, it may be the question of, you know, is our solar system different? Like we see all these other exoplanet systems. Uh, maybe our solar system is the odd one out. And it raises all sorts of questions about like, maybe, you know, our solar system is what you need to have life. And maybe those systems can't support life, but we don't really know the answer to that. Um, and there are also different from a orbital dynamics perspective, the systems we see are different than the solar system. So there's something called orbital resonances that uh, people talk about a lot. So when you have two planets orbiting a star, their orbital periods, which is the amount of time it takes for them to go around the star. So like Earth's orbital period is one year. Um, if the orbital period of two planets are related to each other in a simple way, like one year and two years, uh, then the planets interact with each other in a special way. Like when you push on someone on a swing and you always push them in the same spot, they get a really high swinging amplitude. Uh, and so that's important for planets. But the planets in our solar system don't have any orbital resonances. So the eight planets I mentioned, none of them are in resonance with, with each other. But we found lots of exoplanet systems where there are orbital resonances. So you heard of Trappist-1, there are seven sort of Earth-sized planets, uh, all very close to this really small star. And all seven of those planets are in some sort of orbital resonance with other ones. And so that's like totally different than what we see in our solar system. And actually it's more similar to the moons of Jupiter. So the, the moons of Jupiter that Galileo discovered, the inner three ones are in a similar orbital resonance. And they're about this, the same distance from uh, Jupiter as these Trappist-1 planets are from the star. So they're really quite, these, these systems are really quite different than what we're used to. But at the same time, we're not able to detect Earth or our solar system around other stars. So we don't really know whether it's coming. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mia, how do you measure how fast stars are forming? Great question. So another, well, I guess this isn't actually part of my thesis. Part of my master's thesis was working on this. Um, so there are a couple different ways you can measure how fast stars are forming. So really massive stars, uh, the most massive stars die first. And so if you see a massive star, you know that it has to have been born pretty recently. And so most methods of measuring how fast stars form have to do with measuring how many of these very massive stars that there are. So one way you can do that is, I talked a little bit about this earlier, how most blue light is produced by these really massive stars. Um, because they're so massive, they're also, they also tend to be very hot and very hot things. Like if you look at a flame, the hottest part of the flame is the blue part. So it's the same thing with these very massive stars. They produce a lot of blue light. And so you can measure how much of this very blue or even ultraviolet light is, so even outside of the visible spectrum. Uh, they also tend to produce certain, um, I showed earlier, those like fingerprints from hydrogen. So when the really blue light from these massive stars interacts with the gas in whatever galaxy they're in, whatever system they're in, it also tends to produce a lot of these hydrogen lines. And so you can actually measure that, the strength of those hydrogen fingerprints too. Um, Dylan can talk more about how you can also measure how fast stars form by looking in the radio. So looking in the radio frequencies also um, can be a good measure of how fast, how many massive stars there are and how fast stars are forming in general. Um, the other option is to actually count the number of massive stars that you see. So that's really only possible in the Milky Way. Um, when you're looking at other galaxies, you have to use these other methods like looking at blue light, et cetera. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I think, I think that was a great response. 
Um, another question that maybe you want to take, Mia, but if you don't, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, is it possible for globular clusters to be located within a dwarf galaxy? Um, sure. So the short answer is yes. But Cameron, if you want to elaborate on it, feel free. Oh, um, well, I mean, I was just going to say, yeah, there, there's an active an active area of research in addition to dwarfs are um, newly discovered galaxies that have only we've only really had the technology to be able to detect these recently called ultra diffuse galaxies ultra diffuse dwarf galaxies and as the name suggests they're really spread out so the stars are are very far apart so it's very difficult to see them on the sky because the foreground stars from our own milky way that we're looking through before we can see these objects kind of clouds the view and it makes it difficult to detect these but those galaxies in particular have have globulars that are present globular clusters that are present in them and uh and i think we witness them in a variety of different dwarfs don't don't we mia i i don't know you would know better than i would yeah yeah we observe we observe globular clusters in yeah both josh Riddle and dwarf regular galaxies but yeah that's another really active field of research are, are the formation like how globular clusters form and and as Mia was talking about how they're different from dwarf galaxies intrinsically as well. And, and yeah, I don't know. Lots of, as, as one of the comments in the chat was saying, like there are lots of open questions that we're discussing because these are on the active, you know, edge of, of the field of research that many of us are all working on. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of stuff we still don't understand, but we're working on. Let's see, other questions? How about, we only have a few minutes left. How about this one? This is, uh, this is an interesting question. Is there a Riemann hypothesis for astrophysicists, as in a theory that's largely believed to be true and that lots of work is based off of? But if it ends up being false, it would leave some really big holes or questions in our field. Dylan, you said you potentially would be up for discussing this. Are you are you still up for discussing this? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Um, so this is one of the pre-submitted questions, and I got like a few minutes to think about this earlier today. And an analogy that I came up with is uh, I think so the Riemann hypothesis for some background is this uh, conjecture in math that a lot of uh, mathematical theorems are based off of. And if it turns out to be false, there's lots of math papers, for example, that say, you know, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, we show that blah. Right? Um, but if the Riemann hypothesis turns out to be false, then, you know, all that work essentially also turns out to be false. Uh, and so the analogy that I came up with is that math is kind of like a giant tree, right? Everything is sort of rigidly connected to uh, everything else. And if one of the main branches of the tree breaks off, then like all the leaves and all the stems and everything that's attached to that branch just uh, drops to the ground along with that branch. Um, but in astronomy, it's a little bit different. Uh, I think astronomy is a little bit more like a forest where uh, you can have certain things turn out to be wrong um, and other things that did rely on it do end up uh, you know, being wrong as well. However, there's sort of differing degrees of damage that you can do right, by things being wrong. Like uh, one paper being wrong, like one tree falling down in a forest isn't really gonna do anything to the forest. Um, if like some more fundamental thing um, that uh, many papers rely on uh, ends up being wrong, then maybe like a section of the forest might you know, be caught in a forest fire or a flood or something like that and fall down. But the rest of astronomy uh, a lot of it is just based on things that you can actually see through a telescope uh, or measure through a telescope. And those, uh, while their interpretations might change slightly, uh, won't fundamentally be wrong. And an example of that, for, uh, for example, is let's say that uh, there's some new cosmological theory that isn't lambda CDM, and maybe the expansion of the universe isn't quite as we think it is, then maybe the distances to things might be slightly wrong. 
Uh, and so maybe certain things that we observe in faraway galaxies are actually intrinsically more luminous or less luminous than we thought they were. Uh, that doesn't actually change the fundamental interpretation of what these things are, uh, assuming it's not like some huge discrepancy, uh, but it does change the results slightly, right? And so I think that uh, astronomy as a more like empirically based science is a little bit uh, more resilient in a way to certain parts uh, and people making certain mistakes. I think that's fair. I think that's a well, well considered response. Thank you, Dylan. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's basically our time for this evening. Thank you panelists for your contributions and especially thanks to you, Mia, for your presentation. That was excellent. And all of your responses to questions were terrific. So applause. Yeah. Applause. Um, our audience members, Thank you for attending. Uh, if you like these events, I encourage you to check out our channel. We have two more events that are already uh, the streams you can you can click on. And one will be Astronomy on Tap that's a week from Monday, featuring two short informal talks about the hidden universe and detecting exoplanets with radio telescopes. And I encourage you to come with a beer. It should be fun. We'll have pub trivia, astronomy themed pub trivia, and actually a new method that we're going to try out that will allow you to interact with us, not just through the YouTube comments. We'll have a web page that you can go to and click stuff, and it'll show how everybody else is answering. So it'll be pretty fun. And then our next public lecture is in a month, being given by graduate student Ryan Rubenzall, who will be talking about using the radial velocity method to detect planets around other stars and what kind of technologies we're, we're bumping up against. And the precision of these instruments are able to detect stars that are moving forward or away from us at mere centimeters per hour. Um, no, not centimeters per hour, like 0.2 miles per hour, but centimeters per second, which is super, yeah, centimeters per hour, that'd be pretty outrageous. That'd be like snail pace. So anyway, um, thanks for coming and we'll see you guys in a month. Thank you. Bye, everybody.